Hi, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the Alliance of Independent Authors May 2016 Q&A members only thing. I'm Joanna Penn and I'm here with Orna Ross. Hi, Orna. Hi, Joanna. Hello, everyone. Here we are again, uh, getting closer to the middle of the year. And um, I noticed Dean Wesley Smith, who like, you know, I kind of hero worship, uh, calls this the time of great forgetting, apparently, when everyone forgets to write and just has fun outside. <laughs> yeah, it does get harder when the weather gets good. So actually, I'm a bit of the opposite. Uh, things quieten down now. And this is when I get most writing done in the year. I, I love the summer. I must say, I've got like three months almost completely blocked out to write lots of stuff. So I'm really happy as well. So wherever you are in the year, whenever you are listening to this, always a good time to write. Always, write every day. Always. And that's what we need to talk about today. So that'll be it. Uh, well, no, we do have a few questions, um, but first uh, a little update. So Orna, any update on ally stuff, personal stuff? Because as I always say, we have to remind people that we're actually writers and we don't just talk about this stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, lots happening as always. We are um, post all our conference stuff and uh, looking at publications at the moment and also upgrading our whole um, self-publishing advice website. We keep, a, we keep our advice website separate from the main Ally uh, membership site and that's because it's just got so much information on it and so we're going through a whole project at the moment about how to make that all the information that's there from the fringe and from the blog and from the guidebooks and ev everything that's there more easily accessible and to break it down across the author journey. So that's kind of a big project that's going on in Ally at the moment. And Jay is putting together also a magazine, um, a multimedia magazine around the fringe events so that again, people can kind of get at them and know which ones they want to watch and see people who didn't manage to get it live or if somebody has already watched and wants, wants to kind of uh, go again. So um, yeah, all of that's taking up a, a lot of the Ally resources at the moment. There'll be an upgrade of that site, and I think it's going to be really, really interesting and much easier to, to find our way around. And uh, for myself, then, I am working still on the Go Creator project. Um, oh, why did I ever start this? <laughs> <laughs> Chipping away and it's, uh, you know, good days and bad days. This is a project that really has challenged me, I have to say, um, more than anything else I've ever done. And that's really interesting to me because um, I've always thought of nonfiction as relatively easy, but there's something about these books. It's probably the size and the way I've decided to do it as part of it, but I think it's probably something a bit more than that as well. But I mean, that's what it's all about, isn't it? You stretch yourself, um, otherwise you're not kind of being creative. So um, yeah, that's me, busy, busy. Mm. It's funny you talk about nonfiction being challenging. I am all, I am twenty pages away from finishing the edit of my author mindset book, which, as you know, I've been writing I think for like for ages, and it's it's only thirty thousand words, so it's really short, but it's been so hard to write, and uh, I still don't know how it's going to go down. I've got a few beta readers lined up, but um, it includes chapters like the disappointment of publishing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's probably a similar thing because the, the Go Creative stuff that I'm writing about is about creativity as it applies to life. And it's also got chapters like, you know, failure um, mm. and the whole the down, like the downside. downside adversity and how that is so fundamentally part of the whole creative experience and that's what nobody talks about so everybody talks about you know law of attraction bring on this bring on that it's just mm -hmm. as easy set your intention go after it but actually when you set any sort of creative intention i think you come up against the mindset thing and it's the mindset uh, and the growth that's inherent in it that makes it what you want to do in the first place it's also what mm. makes it hard so yeah, hard definitely right about uh, hard to kind of uh, get control of so we're probably writing relatively slowly for each of us yeah um, for the same same good reason maybe. i would be so glad to have it out um but yeah it is a really interesting process uh and then i will be i've got a short story i've got a short story commissioned <laughs> so um because i'm not very good at short stories i'm going to the british museum to this sunken egypt exhibition in the hope that that will inspire me very specifically to write a short story so i'm really challenging myself on that and then i have a screenplay to write by the end of next week when you and i are doing a course on editing screenplays so i need to have at least well at least a half a book <laughs> or something that i can edit yes 
So yes, good plan. It's a little bit different, you know, writing a screenplay. Yeah, I know, but I'm just going to do it roughly, like like from an existing book, from Deviance. So yeah, uh, yeah I'm probably like, it's ridiculous, but um, your screenplay is pretty much done, isn't it? No, not at all. It's a first <laughs> draft I have that I thought was complete. And then when I picked it up, knowing that we're going to be doing this course in two weeks time, um, picked it up to have a look at it and thought, oh, dear Lord, how on earth did I think this was finished? <laughs> so that's where I am. But uh, yeah, I have a certain amount of it down anyway. A lot of uh, adapting a book to a screenplay, a lot of it is quite boring at first where mm. you're just getting the dialogue down and looking at how, what you do differently and all that kind of stuff. So it's been a great learning experience for me. I don't think I'd do it again. I definitely mm. feel I'm not a screenwriter naturally, but I, I am learning more about my own writing so it's all that's always good and it'll be a bit of fun awesome okay uh so pub let's do some publishing news because everybody loves that and we have a couple of okay first of all really uh cool i think well kind of cool waterstones uh england and for those listening who are not in england it's probably the the upper end of the high street bookstore as in it's a lot of you know most people will know what waterstones is in terms of a bookstore and it's high end and they like books so um and they are actually getting out of the ebook business and they're giving their ebook uh, customers to kobo or presumably selling them um but the customers will go over to kobo and i'm really happy about this because recently nook obviously left um, the UK and and um, also other countries to focus on the US and Nook gave their customers to Sainsbury's which is a supermarket so I'm really happy that Waterstones which I shop at the, the book down bookshop down the road is Waterstones that they they didn't like diss their ebook readers so but that's a, a good move isn't it and I'll also be releasing my sales figures soon for my last year and Kobo I think is almost 30 percent of my income now yeah, we have a lot of people reporting Kobo climbing and 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 we love Kobo because mm -hmm. they are so you know, they are really our books people, they really are author people, they really get it. And um I'm delighted to see them linking up with Waterstones. They also link with WH Smith and of course I don't know how many stores now around mm -hmm. the world. And it's a very clever way to do it because they're they're a small operator, they're but by making strategic partnerships with mm. bookstores everywhere, they are really punching above their weight. And um, yeah, I, I I think it's great. Waterstones did not handle its ebook business well. Oh, useless. It did not serve its ebook readers well. It did not serve its ebook. Um, it did not serve you know ebook authors well. So Kobo knows ebooks and knows how to sell them. So yeah, it's great. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's worth saying there that I think print bookstores just don't have a clue about how to deal online because, as I said, I've been shopping at Waterstones for years. I even have like little Waterstones loyalty cards, but do they have my email address? No, they don't. So, it, and I'm an ebook reader. I would have bought through their Kindle links if they wanted to or their Kobo links or whatever, but they never even tried to get my email. So, you know, for, for I think print, unless print bookstores really try to have a online presence they just can't do digital um yeah so that's interesting uh the second interesting thing well a couple of interesting things uh we had the bookseller uh coming out this week with a sort of ah 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 headline that self-publishing is uh self-publishing is like the biggest threat to publishers to traditional publishing um but their article was behind the paywall <laughs> which i thought was hilarious um so what do, what are your thoughts on that article I was interested in, in the article, not because I think, um, you know, it was a particularly well written piece or anything like that, but because I think it is, to my knowledge, the first time that we've actually seen people putting, you know, in writing what people have been saying for a very long time, which is um, that trade publishing is worried about the self-publishing phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So recently we had um, the old, you know, ebooks are falling story again and the uh, Publishers Association saying self-publishing is no threat whatsoever. Nobody who self-publishes sells any books. There's no household names in self-publishing, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that's much more commonly what you hear coming out um, as the official line. So it was interesting that somebody who's, you know, well sort of embedded within the industry was saying, actually, there is something here that they need to think about. So, um, 
but again it's you know the whole framing of it is so so sort of old because most indie authors are just you know using trade publishing contracts if they are useful to them they're self-publishing some titles they're trade publishing other titles they don't have this them and us kind of mentality going on most of the time so there's a lot of catching up to do and sometimes you can feel like you're you're alice and you've fallen into you know or groundhog day where you're just hearing the same thing yeah. over and over that is true and um I, I don't i can't remember if i mentioned this last time but when i was in austin and spoke about the future of publishing i was like you know we're not the outsiders anymore actually a lot of indies are starting small press and publishing other indies so actually we might be heading for the situation that there was what 50 years ago when actually it was a massive number of small publishers until these big companies came along and started to buy everything up and kind of create all these hundreds of imprints maybe we're actually going to see the fragmentation to the level you know where there are small communities and small lots and lots of small presses i don't actually see most people uh, you know most indies now are kind of doing a lot of things together you know there's lots of promotional stuff together so it's funny and i read the article and i was like if you sub if you change the word self publishing for authors which is basically what it is you've got authors are the biggest threat to traditional publishing <laughs> <laughs> yeah which smells a problem whatever way you look at it yeah exactly yeah. exactly it's kind of crazy but what was interesting was another story that came up which i think is where also what's going to happen so pronoun which it was another one of these um startups uh that essentially a distribution like draft digital or smash words you use them to go to multiple platforms and i immediately was distrustful of them because i couldn't see their business model because it was free to publish so there was no upfront cost and there was no percentage royalty so we trust draft digital and smash words because they take a percentage royalty it's free to publish and they take a percentage same with amazon kdp create space or you know kobo ibooks all these stores take a percentage of sale pronoun was not taking their percentage and i was like uh uh this doesn't this is not sustainable and what's happened is macmillan big publisher macmillan has bought pronoun and they basically said they're going to carry on with a free service and add author services or something so my thought there is okay this is a big publisher deciding to get into self-publishing and we've seen that before haven't we <laughs> well yes and no it's different uh, and it's you know it's it's not say penguin and um penguin random house and author solutions it's not quite the same thing but I, I think you're absolutely right big question mark with pronoun and indeed many other uh, services mm -hmm. in this space who are not charging and they're essentially amassing a, a big mailing list and I think in some cases they don't actually know what their business plan is. Uh, certainly, I'm, <laughs> you not may be saying, right. <laughs> I'm not saying that that's the case with this particular company, um, but certainly there are people who are there with the idea of kind of this is a place where there's lots happening, there's all sorts of activity, money is being made, we should be in there, let's go in there and just kind of make something and be around and see, see what happens and see what way things develop. Similarly, Macmillan, I, you know, the questions we, we've asked Pronan, the questions and we, you know, we interviewed them in depth there a while ago. And then we, when we got this news, spoke to them again, and it's still quite vague. It's, it's mm. difficult to know what exactly is going on there, what, what Macmillan aim is. Um, and, you know, Pronan talk about picking, cherry picking, if you like, those authors who are selling very well and working with them in some way and providing some sorts of services to them. But again, you know, our business model is very clear and Indy's business model is very clear. It's very, very different to a trade publishing authors, mm -hmm. which don't, you know, trade published authors, people who just want to get a publisher, they often don't even have a business plan. They don't think of themselves as business people. They, they write and they give all that away. Mm -hmm. And the two, you know, trade publishing, and if you're an author who's publishing other authors, it's a different model to to somebody who's publishing their own work necessarily. So, yeah, watch this space literally and see see what's coming. All sorts of interesting sort of um, at BEA as well. We saw mm -hmm. lots and lots of services that didn't really. You just could not see how they thought they could make a living out of this. And mm -hmm. it'll be interesting to see how many of them will be there in a year's time. Never mind in five years' time.
Yeah, that's super important. Yeah, so that's some of the interesting things uh, that's been going on. I'm sure there's lots more, but those are the things that I noticed. Uh, okay, let's get into the questions. Maribel says, how would you define the difference between being a nonfiction writer or a journalist? I consider myself a nonfiction writer, but was recently nominated for an award under nonfiction and journalism. Uh, I'm slightly confused. Well, I guess it's a question, Maribel, of long form, short form. Um, so journalism is, is short form writing and features journalism is the longest um, of the forms. And generally speaking, even the, the most expansive magazine will not give you a, an article above 12,000 words, say. A uh, nonfiction author, the, the definition of an author is, is generally somebody who has published a book, which used to, by definition, make you an authority. And that's where the word author came from. Obviously, self-publishing has changed that to some degree because lots of people are publishing books that they, you know, and there is no authority really contained within, within that publication. But that, that's generally the difference. And a writer is somebody who can write journalism, books, blah, 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 you know, a writer covers, covers the whole lot of it. That's my understanding anyway. It's interesting because I, I had an awesome interview with Sebastian Younger who wrote, um, oh, what's it called? I can't remember what he wrote now. He wrote loads of really good books. I'm drinking wine. <laughs> um, on, on the Tim <laughs> Ferriss. Drinking wine. <laughs> Cheers. Um, on the Tim Ferriss show, uh, oh, The Perfect Storm is his famous one, and he's written a whole lot of other things. And he basically said that a, the job of a journalist is to report the situation without a personal slant. So, you know, he, he's also written a book called War, and it's like, this is what happened in the war, um, versus someone who's writing an, a book, of which he's also written books, has uh, is putting their slant on it. I would see that as a very old definition. I mean, it yeah. used to be journalism was the the, the, the five the W's, you know, who, yeah, what, where, where, why. Yeah. Um, but, you know, features journalism, which kind of really took off in the 1990s and, and you had this whole thing where people were actually excavating their own lives. I mean, no newspaper now is uh, has a weekend supplement that doesn't have at least two or three columns where people talk about their, oh, yeah. you know, their kids and their whatever and that I think is still broadly considered journalism but it's like everything in the creative field there actually often isn't one clear and, and distinct answer but I think the idea that only news journalism is journalism is is an older idea maybe we should go back to that though mm. um, and I think journalism you know there's a real need for it more good journalism on the internet i think is something that we can we could see newspapers are not invest investing in uh, good journalism anymore and very few people can afford to be journalists because mm. you do need support of somebody else so um yeah yeah that is a whole other discussion probably it is. interesting one uh okay kelly says uh talking to me um in a previous q a i said i was moving from nook press to draft to digital and she says i thought your advice up to now was to always go direct why the change okay so yes well no actually my advice is to go direct if <laughs> it's the best solution for you so for example i go direct to ibooks but if you haven't got a mac or if you're not particularly technical it's hard to go direct to ibooks um yes i was going direct to nook with nook press but two things really annoyed me. One, they're them pulling out of the UK and the rest of the world. I think it was 28 countries they pulled out of. And to me, that does not signify commitment. <laughs> um, and two, the Nook Press platform is very, whenever I try and use it, it's really slow and it breaks and it's a nightmare. And I've had real pain actually getting my books to get through some of their checks like a book that works fine on Kobo breaks on Nook so in the end I was just like this is ridiculous um and I talked to Dan at draft to digital and because draft to digital is so easy to use and it's just another checkbox to add it on Nook I was like do you know what I'm just going to move everything to draft to digital so um now I'm direct on Amazon Apple Kobo and I'm using draft to digital um, yeah. for everything else I think that's happening all over the place. Um, the commitment to Nook Press has never been 
No, it's, it's always it. been a bit crap. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, I think what happened was that Barnes & Noble felt they should have a digital platform. And it's very, it's a bit like what you were talking about with Waterstones earlier on. And they're mm. very comparable, um, Barnes & Noble and Waterstones. And their attitude to digital, you know, has just, it hasn't followed through, I think, because they do come from a very different business model and a very different perspective on books. So um, a huge number of people have deserted Nook either because they they had to and they didn't have an option because even the way in which they pulled out of, of you know, supplying um, their mm. service was very haphazard and not very caring or careful. So um, yeah, it's, I, I think they're, they're also kind of waiting to see who might buy it. <laughs> Well, the, the way it's going, though, you know, you end up wondering if anyone will bother because it, you know, it must be just kind of going like this. I don't know. That's personal opinion. <laughs> I know that a lot of our um, US members who were selling well, you know, it was Barnes & Noble was their second always, uh, you know, so first it would have been Amazon, second Barnes & Noble, and then the, the rest of far distance behind. I know that landscape is changing for a lot of people. Yeah, absolutely. And also, uh, I think I mentioned last time that I've gone back to selling direct because um, sells, S-E-L-Z, um, and the other platforms like Gumroad and all that, they now have a checkbox that says N don't sell to people in the EU. And there is an um, exemption if you are in the UK selling to the UK. So basically, I decided to return to selling direct and I check the checkbox. So I'm, I'm sorry if you're in the EU trying to buy from my store directly, you can't. Just because it's such a pain in the ass that I didn't want to do that. But I'm really happy and um, I won't report on it this year because basically my tax year has just finished. But next year I'll report on what percentage of my sales came direct because I'm making at the moment probably one sale a day, which is not massive, but that's only just literally, I've just turned it all back on again. So I think uh, the direct sales, if you have a website with traffic, um, is also another another way. And sales is, you know, even e is very easy to use, basically. Yeah. And there are lots of options. Mm -hmm. And I think this whole thing of selling direct is going to become much bigger in the next year. Uh, you've got Aereo coming on stream as well. And they allow you to set up, um, even if you don't have your own website, to set up your own bookstore anywhere mm -hmm. online. And... Um, you know, using direct with uh, a good advertising or promotional campaign can mm. actually work very well if you know what you're doing. As always, this applies more to nonfiction and very, very discreet and distinctive fiction than it does uh, to, to more general sort of fuzzy fuzzy fiction um, but <laughs> across genre stuff it doesn't tend to do so well on this but yeah keep an eye on direct and and really it makes no sense not to be and um, not to have a direct option on your website it doesn't cost anything much to set it up you can even just you know do paypal even if you don't want to go the whole way it, it's it's good to just have it there because obviously mm. you can you know, you might as well as not. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and you can sell things that you wouldn't sell elsewhere. Like, I'll probably sell a bundle of all my fiction, you know, so you can get for a discount. So you can get, like, if you just want everything or each of the series or, you know, that type of bundle, because you might change it out quite often, you wouldn't bother putting it on, uh, you know, Kobo and iBooks, and you would never put it on Amazon because you'd have to price it under nine ninety nine. So I think it will give us all more. And also, oh, this is something else we should mention. A lot of people, including myself, are having falling income from audiobooks. And I wanted to mention it because previously we've like raved and raved about audiobooks. Um, but many people are seeing their income drop. Mine has. Last year, my, I think my audiobook income was 7% of my total sales. This year, it's 2% of my total sales so it's really dropped um print has held hold its own around seven percent but um yeah and i think this is and as now an audiobook listener i know why it's because i'm paying 7.99 pounds or something for one credit a month and i'm getting i'm getting a like 27 pound uh, audiobook um, my husband's on a bigger plan and gets them even cheaper or credits for, for cheap and also if people own the ebook they get the audiobook for super super cheap so I'd also say that the over 50% of my audiobook income is from my one non-fiction and all my fiction has just completely fallen off a cliff 
So I don't know if you have any anecdotal you, evidence. On you that. are not alone. Mm. No, you're not alone. And subscription models are eating into audiobooks. Uh, is something that, as you say, we used to sort of rave about. Um, and there are a lot of work, and a lot of people didn't get into it. But those who did, you know, were doing well because it was a quite, you know, quite a substantial royalty that you took away at the end of the day. But um, it, this is just gradually now eroding this away, which is, I think, a real pity. Um, but yeah. So I'm, I, this is mine now. I'm going to sell my audiobooks direct on my website. I'm going to record Only. them. Yeah. Yeah. For my non-fiction anyway. And I'll, mm. I'll probably just hold off for fiction, see what happens. But I thought I should mention that because we haven't really talked about it and we'll talk about it again some point back to the questions sally says when the book is finally finished what is the order in which to get it published editing beta readers proofreaders and formatting uh this is my first book so i want to get it right yeah um beta reader first then sorry i need to look and see what order there is that's, that's um depends how you define it i would never do that i always okay, go yeah, I would, I go, if it's my first book, I would have a structural edit. Um, if it's certainly, if it's fiction, I really, really needed that um, because often your structure is wrong or it needs help. And then a line edit, you know, like a, you know, full on red ink edit. Um, once I'd made all those changes, um, I, I only send to beta readers for expert reads. So like um, an Indian person for my Destroyer of Worlds, so I didn't get anything culturally wrong, or a volcanologist to check my volcanoes and risen gods. Um, and then I make all the changes, and then I only send to a proofreader just before uploading. Okay, that's very interesting. Well, um, another alternative way to do it. So it seems to be like everything in writing. Yeah, there, is, there is many ways to do it. Um, an alternative way to do it would be to think that, you know, and particularly if your budget is tight, that you want to be sending the work to an editor when it is in the best possible nick uh, for the editor to add the most that they can add to it. And so to get some informal reads first and to get feedback at that level before you take it into editing um, that's always the way I have approached it and I know that's the way lots of other people approach it too and then perhaps uh, you know at a later stage if, if it's um, again I would have thought expert read earlier on but uh, another thing you might use be for depending on who they are is to actually blurb the book a bit and you know give do a joint thing where they give you a bit of feedback on it and also give you a, a testimonial so it looks like uh, there is no definitive right answer here. You need to think a little bit about your own situation and what shape the book, what shape you feel the book is in. And also, you know, your access. I think the most important thing with a beta read is your access to good readers. Uh, you know, not everybody is equally good. And also that you give them something to work with, give them a good um, outline of what it is you want to know, what, what sort of answers you want to get back from them. So give them an actual questionnaire as something for them to answer so that they are clear in what you want from them yeah and although you might book a formatter in advance you only give books to a formatter or format them when it is completely done <laughs> oh, yeah. um and uh also no remember there. that's definitely right <laughs> yeah and also you should definitely book a cover design early and if you know your title and get that done um, because often cover designers are booked up in advance. Yeah, and um, I know some people who get a cover design as the very first thing because it helps them to visualize what they're doing and where they're kind of going and then end up having to get a different one at the end or maybe not. Um, but yeah, a, a good editor also is not somebody you can just yeah. say, okay, my book is finished now, now I need an editor. If somebody's mm -hmm. available at that short notice, they're probably not really what you need. Yeah, but a lot of the, I think we're at, we're at this point at the moment where, you know, the really top editors, top cover designers, you need to book them well in advance unless you're an established customer. So, um, yeah, definitely do that. Uh, Sarah, my illustrator is having problems uploading my children's picture book to Amazon. Uh, some various technical issues, basically. Um, no real contacts at Amazon. Can you recommend a contact who knows more about uploading um, who I can hire? 
So what I did there, just when we saw your question coming through, was um, put a call out on the Facebook forum. And we have these two kinds of ways in which members can get advice. And um, the Q&A here with uh, Joanne and myself, I think, is less useful for that sort of query. If you go onto the Facebook forum and ask for that sort of help, You'll actually get people jumping in and saying, you know, either I can do it and let's mm. talk or uh, one of the, the partner members or else you'll hear from other authors who've been in a similar situation. So um, I have put a call out for you and we'll, we'll look and see if there is an answer afterwards. And also Karen Inglis may be able to help as well. She's our children's advisor and she may be able to to help. It's It's something that you probably best advised to learn how to do but certainly yeah. somebody can help you first time out so that you can kind of find your feet but um yeah and get the skill as, as soon as you can children's tricky at so so many levels i always feel for children's authors it's challenging it really is yes but possible and karen is often the person to ask because also she doesn't like something she can't understand or do so <laughs> I dare say if you pose Karen a question, she will find out. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> because, yeah, she's like a master of everything. She's just um, fantastic. She is. Um, Julie says, do you need to send hard copies of all print books to the British Library or whichever is your country's top library thing? Yeah, well, it varies from country to country. Um, this is what's known as legal deposit. And yes, is the short answer. So the in the UK, it's the British Library, but also in the US, all the countries have their various sort of national library. And the idea was that um, certain, back in the day when there were fewer books, back in the day when there were fewer books and all books came between covers and were made of paper. Um, the idea was that there would be certain libraries of record which would store every book ever made so that people would be able to find it's really a scholarly thing so that academics can find the books they need to build on the world's knowledge kind of thing obviously it's all falling apart and mm -hmm. <laughs> because of the proliferation of books and because libraries national libraries some libraries are really go ahead and fantastic around digital and and ebooks but a lot of the national libraries have been slow on this end of things to kind of even recognize that some books don't come between covers and are only available in digital form and how do you um you know how do you record it how do you how do you send it to them and, and so on and it varies hugely across the world and it's all a big mess really which they're they're kind of beginning to sort out but in the meantime if you yes if you live in the uk there is a legal requirement for you to send any print book that you publish and um, to six copies actually to six, <laughs> six different libraries yeah, so okay well i don't do no, that lots of people don't i mean if they come after it then sure they can have a copy i bet you they do do not want six copies of blooming self-published books uh, in fact they probably don't want all the books from all the publishers and they don't want all these books what are they going to do with them all <laughs> nonetheless it is the law of the land <laughs> yeah. and also there are authors that really want their books to be in those national libraries there are authors who Fair want enough. that sort of sense of being on the record so um yeah so if you want to then do if you don't it's unlikely they're going to come after you and if they did come after you it would simply be to ask you to do it yeah. <laughs> and nobody's going to arrest you <laughs> no <laughs> i'll sue you for all your copies of your books okay fair enough <laughs> Okay, cool. Jean says, I self-published my first novel only to have the first publisher go out of business. Um, I accepted their recommendation for my for a replacement publisher, but um, then it became obvious they were only interested in, mo in money, not production needs. How do I take my published book to a new printer and also do an ebook? Uh, and second question, I have a new book underway. Is it best to wait for completion before deciding on a company um, for ebook formatting? Uh, sorry to ask questions that are obvious to you. Sincerely, new member, which is so sweet, Jean. You ask whatever you like. Absolutely, that's what we're here for. And you can be sure that every question you have asked, lots of other people are also seeking the same answers. Yeah. So it's really useful to ask ask those questions 
I begin by saying that as self-publishers, we need to understand that we are the publisher. So what you're hiring is not a publisher, you're hiring a service. And it sounds like you're hiring a printer who does consignment print. And I that... think maybe the wording is wrong. I think he means like a, a publishing services company, not a printer, like a consignment printer. Oh, okay, okay. I, from my, the way I read it, I think, yeah, I don't think it's that. I think it's, I've used X company, uh, not to be named or whatever and then they've gone out of print I might I have a print copy of a book but I want to get it back out into the world so pro possibly Jean doesn't know about print on demand for example no, so if like someone that. comes to you and says I I have a previously published book what shall I do now to get this back into the world so I think, first of all, we need more information to be absolutely sure about your situation. So please feel free again to, you know, use the forum or to send an email and we can get into the nitty gritty of the detail. But let's let's assume that it is a service, a publishing service. The point still stands that you are the publisher and you hired a service, you own the book and so on. However, if the book has been, you know, distributed through all the various channels by this company, we need to know what has happened when the company went out of business, what they did with the titles they had published and so on. So without the nitty gritty of that detail, it's hard to give you advice. However, for your next book, uh, we'll sort that out for you. If, As I said, if you if you just send us an email and we'll, we'll see what happens next with that one. For your next book, you definitely need to think about ebooks and print on demand. So um, you, you need to go what we call DIY essentially you will then you won't have this trouble again and uh, you you know and um, so yeah I'm just kind of thinking I think really the only way we can deal with this is to get a direct email and and to see exactly where you are and to kind of lead you on from there yeah because it's quite um there are quite a few decisions I guess along the way um but the Alliance for Independent Authors has books doesn't it for members yeah, of course. Um, a good place to start will be to download how to choose a self-publishing service. And that will explain to you the distinctions that we're talking about here between hiring a publishing service that does kind of everything for you um, and can go out of business so thereby you don't know where your book is and choosing the DIY option, which is that you, you know, hire in various services that you need separately um, and it will also explain the distinction between a consignment print and print on demand and, and all that you need to know essentially to make an informed decision here so um, yep. that is also an option yes choosing a self-publishing service the book i recommend several times a week <laughs> <laughs> and there are lots and lots of great books. All our advisors, including Joanna, write fantastically about all the various options. So do inform yourself by reading up and around. Um, even if you then decide that you actually want to give everything to somebody else, it will be an informed decision. And be aware also that we do have partner members who um, provide full service as well as DIY services, and some of whom, you know, are our author members absolutely swear by them and they publish book after book after book after book with them because they do what they do extremely well so it is an option but I have to say that the number of services that do that and do that very well is quite small the vast majority of full service companies are not doing a great job for their authors and you need to know which one uh, you know which one does and which one doesn't and Choosing a self-publishing service will not only talk about some of the better ones, but it also gives you the criteria you need uh, to evaluate, make your own evaluation. Great. Edmund says, what is the current best practice on formatting? More than a year ago, Joanna recommended hiring it out, which I did. Now I need to change the back matter. Could I hire a pro or use Scrivener or some other program to do it myself? I know it's got to be mobile friendly. So Edmund, once again, I, I would say that I'm, I would have said do it yourself on Scrivener as I do um, or if you're not very technical hire it out to someone else I believe uh, that's what I would have said isn't it Honor? I generally recommend doing it yourself <laughs> yeah we usually I mean I'm so not techie and I can do Scrivener you know so it isn't that hard <laughs> yeah so basically um, Edmund the, I think the current best practice is 
uh, is up to you how much you want to do. So I use Scrivener for eBooks, but I do pay um, uh, the wonderful JD Smith Design to do my print formatting because it just looks better when she does it, and I can't do it myself because I just don't care what side the page numbers go on. Um, so uh, yeah, I would say you can decide. But um, some people use Juto, G U uh, J U T O H. Um, and other things? Yeah, people use Calibre and C A Caliber, C A L I B R E, I think. Mm. And um, more and more people are getting into InDesign and mm. doing everything on HTML and so on. I mean, some some indies absolutely love all that. I yeah. love, love getting their hands dirty. I like you. Uh, no, print goes out to people who are good at that. From you know, from my my point of view, but it's good to work with indies like. Um, Jane, um, Joanna mentioned there, and um, at the moment I'm working with a, a young designer called Amy McCracken, and she also does, um, you were talking earlier on about authors publishing authors, Jessica Bell publishes now a number of authors, and Amy works with them too, and she's got a flexible sort of approach so that if, when it comes to the inevitable changes that you want to make, you can do that, you know, you mm. don't have to pay all over again and you know they understand that you are going to need to update your back matter probably your front matter things change particularly in a non-fiction book we update all our non-fiction books um you know well at different rates depending on but choosing a self-publishing service gets up, up graded every year and requires sometimes that's a full change and sometimes it's smaller changes so formatters who are used to working with indies are very used to the need for that change so yeah um i would say best for financially makes more sense to learn how to do your own ebooks because most people don't expect ebooks to be beautifully laid out unless they, you know there's a particular reason to do so um but yeah when it comes to a nice print book it, it definitely unless you love it hand that one over yeah Okay, speeding up. Um, Jim says, I'm a new author and will be engaging individuals to help with editing uh, and proofreading. This may involve, well, this will actually involve sending copies of my book to people I've not met. Is it possible, basically, that um, it it is released in this draft form? Um, either stolen or released accidentally. Is there a mechanism to protect against this um, for asserting copyright before publication? Um, yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> um, the first thing to say is because you're a member of the Alliance, these are real people, so you can actually meet them virtually in the member forum. That's one thing. But secondly, copyright is yours from the moment you, you have written um, the words. The chances of anybody doing what you fear are very, very remote. Um, it's not something that you need to, to worry about. Just concentrate on getting the book done and making the best possible book. Trust professionals to be professional. These people are in business. They, you know, they do what they do. They take great pride in what they do, and they will be very quickly out of business if they were doing anything. And it's also quite difficult to imagine what anybody's motive would be in doing that. So, um, yeah, I would say, you know, don't worry about that at all. Just concentrate on getting your book done and uh, finding the right professional to help you. So, a person who has experience. In your genre, a person who understands your book and what you're trying to do with it, um, a designer who has, works on books and again understands the needs of your of your genre and of the type of book that you're writing. That's where your energy should go, and and don't worry too much about this stuff at all. This is something that people worry about before they publish. Once people are up and running and they see how it works, it's it's not something that arises. I haven't ever seen a problem with anything like this at all. No, but it's surprisingly common worry. So yeah. I think it's uh, I think it's some kind of uh, you know anxiety about letting go of the book. Actually, you know, yeah, I think, probably I think, is a lot deeper. Yes, I think so. I think it yeah. is something that is projected onto a worry around copyright and about. But it's really kind of as writers, sometimes we find it difficult. You know, we spend so long with this work and hold it so close, and it's depending on the book, it can actually be like a physical part of us nearly. 
and I think anxiety gets projected onto that particular worry but it's not something to worry about at all yeah uh it makes it makes me worried about my mindset book again that I've not been gentle enough I think I might I think it's a bit hardcore and I keep looking at it going I don't know if people want to know this stuff <laughs> You know what I mean? And uh, yeah, we're all fra fragile beings when it comes to our books. Definitely. And um, those two sides need to be kind of taken. We also need to know the truth, yeah. you know, because we're also very good at fooling ourselves. Uh, we're very imaginative creatures and we imagine, yeah. you know, things are going to be quite different to how they are. So, uh, yeah, we need to do that for ourselves, don't we? On the one hand, kind of be nice gentle with ourselves and encouraging of ourselves so we can get ourselves to do it and then we have to later on or later on in the same day in some cases turn around and be no you know do the work quite, quite strict <laughs> and that won't do yeah so it's challenging oh, yeah. it is challenging who said this was easy um maggie oh we're on to marketing oh i'll do the quick one janet says um when I had an Amazon affiliate account, the Amazon ID I was assigned was based on my website. Um, Joanna seems to have an affiliate account with an, a specific ID, which to is totally different from her website. <laughs> Orna doesn't seem to be an Amazon affiliate, I wonder why. So personally, okay, so if anyone doesn't know, an Amazon affiliate code, which I would recommend getting, is basically whenever you, whenever you link to your own books or someone else's books, you can get a percentage of the sale. It's a tiny, tiny percentage, like you might make a few cents. But when you have a website like mine with quite a lot of traffic, it can be reasonable money um, but when i say reasonable it's still only like a couple of hundred dollars a month so never expect it to be like the big bucks but um it it can also be used in various ways to track advertising and things so it's quite useful so um my affiliate code is um basically from my first first ever website which was how to enjoy your job.com so that's when i got my affiliate id and that's why it doesn't match the creative pen uh, so that is why mine is random. Do you have one, Orna? I thought you did. I do have it, but I don't use it in that way. I don't use, um, I've just, uh, not for any particular reason, it just never really seemed worthwhile because it is yeah, such so tiny. Money. And affiliate, I don't do affiliate income. Um, it's one of the things that the Alliance decided not to do affiliate income so that we, mm would be just, you know, our members would be able to trust that we were completely, not that you can't trust people who are doing affiliate, um, of course you can, but just <laughs> from the point of view of being a non-profit organisation, it just seems to keep it free from affiliate fees, it seems to just keep everything easier. Mm. And, and, uh, yeah, I, affiliate income is a significant part of my income, um, but I only recommend services, courses, products that I use myself. So like Scrivener, I'm an affiliate of Scrivener um you know stuff like that i've been offered quite significant money from companies who want to, me to recommend them and i don't do that so you can be an aff affiliate income is a totally normal part of internet business the the difference is whether you use it in an ethical manner to only recommend things that you actually think are good versus people who use it to just recommend anything so um that really is the ethical line and there are ethical lines in everything we do um i completely agree with everything you just said by the way um absolutely excellent uh maggie says my book is done and now i'm looking for some of the best ways to market it well done maggie many authors never get that far <laughs> um i'm doing some historical societies as the book is non-fiction i'm also targeting local bookstores i'm trying to get on tv but so far nothing i'm eager for any or all suggestions uh in which case i would just like to put a plug out because i have a book called how to market a book <laughs> I'm allowed to plug my stuff occasionally. Absolutely, it's um, um, yeah, well also, worth a read. Yes. yes, thank you. And also, like on my site, the Creative Pen, I have about like around two, you know, sort of two and a half thousand articles on it, and loads of podcasts, and like all kinds of stuff. And the self publishing um, advice org has a ton of stuff on marketing, doesn't it? Yeah, we've lots of, of stuff. I mean, I I think we would have to say that Joanna Penn is one of the foremost people in book marketing. Um, I mean, you just, there is nothing about book marketing that Joanna doesn't know. So absolutely follow up on that. The thing that it's important for you to realize is that 
if you're going to be looking to sell ebooks, you may not be going the best way about it in terms of even with TV. I mean, TV used to be the sort of ching ching of book sales. Not but anymore. Not anymore. Um, again, you've got the proliferation issues. So if you're selling ebooks, you're probably best to concentrate more on internet marketing. Again, we'd need to know more about your particular situation to be able to give you specific marketing advice. But uh, just generally speaking, don't even go there until you have your kind of sales funnels set up and you know what you're doing. And I, I see a lot of writers, as soon as they finish the book, they're off marketing and in fact off searching for marketing services and paying a lot of money for marketing services. And they're not actually um, geared to take advantage, even if loads of people did want to buy the book. They don't necessarily provide the information in a way that is likely to make that happen, if you know what I mean. So there are two kinds of market. There are three if you include promotion, which is kind of specific stuff around, say, particular sales drives. But there is a sort of marketing that's built into the book itself, which I would think is the thing that you really need to be sure that you've got right, which is things like your book description, your cover and so on. All of that is marketing, how you present your your pages, really, really important. And then there is, you know, how you let the reader know the book is available. And, and that's where you need to think, you know, publicity is not a very efficient way of doing that generally speaking yeah i mean just you know for a non-fiction thing you mentioned uh historical societies um you know for, a, for you know you would be better off finding the top 10 blogs around the historical aspect of your book and then trying to get guest posting on those blogs. For nonfiction, guest posting is still good. Getting on podcasts is brilliant. I get pretty much all my book recommendations now from podcasts that I listen to, or Twitter, basically. Um, I don't get them anywhere else. Uh, fiction I get from search and you know from looking in categories uh, so yeah that's quite different but for non-fiction and actually this is another thing that we found from my year's worth of data my biggest sellers um, my they're very different for fiction and non-fiction but for fiction my biggest sellers are the ones with the SEO titles so like how to market a book is specifically titled around an SEO search term. Um, and so is uh, how to make a living with your writing. That was also titled specifically for a search term. And those two books do the best on Amazon because Amazon is a search engine. So whatever, you know, I know it might be too late because you've titled your book, but search, you know, the that think about Amazon as a search engine, your title, your description, your keywords. These are actually major things around marketing your book. So this is all very detailed stuff. Um, but you can find all of that at um, either of the websites we mentioned. Uh, oh, and this is kind of following on. Um, Emmett says, how does one go about identifying, engaging and maximizing the investment in a book publicist? Yeah. Um, what is a book publicist first, Orna? Well, uh, ch changing definitions too, isn't there? I mean, traditionally, uh, you know, a marketing person did direct marketing on behalf of your book and, you know, took your book out to people who would be likely to buy it, where the publicist tried to get you into the newspapers or onto television or onto the, you know, the, the couch or the sofa or the radio show or whatever. It's all merging now and, and publicists are trying to do um, a bit of everything. So again, you know, there are a lot of people working in this space who are not really delivering that well, but they're managing, you know, they don't have repeat business. So the first thing I would say is always check with the authors who have actually used the publicist you're thinking of using. Mm -hmm. Secondly, make sure that your publicist is indie friendly, understands the particular needs of, of indie authors. There's still a remarkable number of publicists who work with publishers, take on authors and don't understand what they need to know in order to, 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 um, to work for and with an indie. So that, they will be two big things that I, I could think about. Um, but we do, again, we have information on the Self-Publishing Advice Centre about how to choose um, a good service in this area as in every other it's the same people don't realize but when we're talking about a self-publishing service we're not just talking about 
printers or people who do the sort of cradle to grave stuff we're talking about every single service that an indie might buy and um, so again if you check out that publication that will give you the right questions to ask and the things that you should be thinking about but again i would say if you're going to hire anyone it's best to know what you want anyway so it's actually better for you to spend a bit of time you know learning what book marketing is yourself um and this is where we all start you know i only wrote a book on how to market a book because i didn't know how to market a book so i decided to learn and the best way to learn is to write a book about it <laughs> in my opinion um so i would say emmett and anyone else who is still like oh my goodness i hate marketing marketing makes me go there which is what a lot of people say it's just because you haven't really learned about it yet but like any part of the process to be a successful indie, you actually have to be curious enough to find out about things, even if you're not interested. So for example, I did once do my own print formatting and I know I was crap at it because my books looked crap. So since then I hire professionals to do my, you know, cover design and my print formatting because I'm not gonna do that. Um, so these are the things. So once you actually understand how marketing works in general, then you can assess what you are willing to pay for. Um, but in my experience, I haven't really, in terms of marketing, I don't think there's anything that's worth paying for. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? I mean, I pay Facebook for Facebook marketing. I pay BookBub for email blasts out to people, but I've never paid a service to try and do these things for me because we can actually do it ourselves now. again it slightly comes back to though that you are very good at it joe you but know, only because i've tried well i yes, wasn't indeed. born good at this stuff was i <laughs> no but you know there are people who try and they're just not going to or they they haven't got what it takes now i think to some you know the the, the first part of the marketing uh, jigsaw that we were talking about i think everybody needs to go there because actually what you're talking about is the bridge between you the author and the reader, you know, and there is that aspect of marketing I think everybody should do. But when it comes to the actual, you know, taking the book out there, there is, you know, there are some people who are best to pay for that service. But, you know, you really need to know what you're doing. And so it's a very good question that you're asking. So uh, go into it a little bit more and maybe then if we get the specifics of your book and so on, we could we could have more with mm -hmm. that maybe next month. But don't, but please don't pay someone five grand a month retainer with no specific around deliverable because that's what I get emails about. That's what people say, I did this and I got nothing. And it's like, well, you have to, you have to define what success is and then pay for the service that will get to you that what that is specifically. So that's, you know, just a warning. <laughs> <laughs> that happens most i think with publicity and it's i think we've said it here before it's one of the very few services in the world where you can actually say you know i'm going to charge you three or four thousand pounds and i may not get anywhere you anything. <laughs> <laughs> i may not get your book into anything at all but you know i'll try i'll make some phone calls <laughs> <laughs> anyway uh we are look we've done almost an hour again we always chat on don't we but people have message to say that they enjoy our kind of chats in between so that's good and we always love to hear from you so please do send us your questions for next month uh we will be back on tuesday the 28th of june uh, just after the longest day of the year here in the UK. Um, uh, so, uh, yep, uh, let's all get back to writing. Any final words, Orna? No, just keep the questions coming. Uh, they're really useful, not just, as I said, it's not just the answer that we give to you but for every single question there. There will be lots and lots of people who have benefited. So it's a, it's a service that you're doing for everybody else. And thanks for being here. Thank you. Bye. Bye.